Philippians chapter number 3. Before we read that, let me get your mind going in a certain direction. I told some of you this recently. But when Carol and I were dating, which has been a long time ago, we used to do some goofy things. I used to do some goofy things, all right? How many can remember being in love way back in the day? So you know what all I'm talking about. You understand. You just do goofy things. They seem like cool, great ideas at the time. So we used to write goofy notes back and forth. I did most of the goofy writing. They, teenagers don't write many notes. They text message these days. But we wrote notes back in the day, paper and pen. And so trying to be ingenious, I tried to write different kinds of notes. And so I decided I would write to Carol in German. I don't know German. So I got an English-German dictionary. And I wrote her a letter and translated it into German. That's not accurate. I wrote her a English, a, a, the words were German, but the sentence structure and, uh, and all of that was English, okay? So a German could not have read this thing. It seemed like a good idea at the time. We were celebrating, I think, maybe our 25th anniversary, and I decided that I would do some of those goofy things. We were trying to celebrate for almost the whole year our anniversary, and so I would decide I would do some of these goofy things that I did when I was a kid. Well, it's a lot easier with electronics these days. And so I was sitting at the computer, and the, there's a translator on the thing. And so I thought, I'm going to send Carol a message in German. So I typed into this translator, you are a great wife. OK, translated it, comes up with these German words. I cut that out of there, and I pasted it into an email. I got ready to send click send, and then I realized, you know, Carol is going to paste that back into this translator. So I thought, I wonder what it's going to actually say. You are a great wife. When I pasted it back in and clicked translate, it said, you are a large woman. He's trying to kill me. <laughs> now, you can see that. You can see how the translation goes that way. Now, I learned some lessons there, but <laughs> the thought process here is, you know, it's possible to hear something, and in your mind, you hear it correctly, but in your mind, you translate it completely differently. And the way it goes in is not the way that it comes out. Does that make sense to you? Now, use that thought process as we read verses here that you have heard, you can quote actually. As we read these, keep that in mind. I want to make sure that my, the way that I'm reading this and translating and applying this is actually what it means. Philippians chapter number 3. Verse number 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Flip the page, Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. You quoted the verse, you've sang the song. Well, what does it really mean? The title of this morning's message, Rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you know we cannot get there from here unless you take us. We want to get where we need to be. We want our minds thinking correctly. We want our responses to you accurate. Father, we want to love you. But you know how foolish we are. You know how simple we are. And we're asking that by your grace, you would take us by the hand and lead us into what you intended. Keep us from error. Remove false thinking. And may we understand and live what you meant when you wrote these words. We thank you that we have you to come to and expect you to work because we are your children, and it is your heart to do so. And we ask this in the precious name of Christ. 
Amen. Let's be very basic this morning. Point number one. What does it mean to rejoice? What does it mean to rejoice? It says rejoice in the Lord, but what does it mean to rejoice? By definition, it means to be full of cheer, to be glad, or to celebrate. The words often fall flat when we're trying to describe emotion, so think about what does it mean to rejoice? In a real kind of way, when do you rejoice? Well, when your daughter and your son-in-law write you and say, we're expecting. Okay, a man can dream, can't he? (laughs) When you hear that good news, you rejoice. Even more so when you step into the hospital and you pick up that little one for the first time. And you rejoice. Those are times of rejoicing. You rejoice when the boss calls you into your, his office and says, you know what, I'm going to give you a raise. You're doing such a good job, I'm going to give you a raise. Or when you open up your paycheck, bonus in there, your heart rejoices. We rejoice all, on all kinds of things. When you beat the high score on the app on your phone that you've been playing, you rejoice. When all the family is back home safe for the holidays, you rejoice. Almost every single day, often multiple times a day, We find occasions, either big or small, to rejoice. That's what it means to rejoice. You know what that means. Point two, we often rejoice in things that aren't that good or that turn out badly. We often rejoice in things that aren't really that good or that actually are going to turn out badly. I don't know what it's like now, but when we were kids, game shows were big on television. How many remember The Price is Right? What was the guy's name? I could not think of that this morning. Bob Barker. Come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. So you watch them, these contestants, they come and they're competing on this thing. And the prizes, I don't know if you were paying attention, but the prizes that they offered, did you ever notice the price on them? The price was three or four times what it was actually what these things were worth. You could have gone to the store in town and bought it for a third of the price, or maybe a quarter of the price of what the manufacturer suggested retail price is, and you'd get that, okay? And so that's what they were, the prize that they were offering was this overinflated price. So anyway, these people would compete, and you, you remember the whole thing, and they would compete, and cha-ching, they won. They spun the wheel, they did whatever, and they won. You remember what the people did? This person goes crazy. The whole family comes running up. They're hopping up and down, and they're hugging each other, and they're uh, hugging Bob Barker, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're complete pandemonium. They are rejoicing. But, you know, I read that the IRS taxed those people on that stuff. And the actual figure was, since they had inflated the price so high, that the tax money that you had to pay was more than what the prize that you actually got. If you went out and bought it at Walmart or whatever, the price was higher in taxes than what it would have cost you. And so a lot of the people actually refused the prize after the game. Now, compare the hopping up and down, hooray, 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 and then walking out, I can't afford that prize. You see, you're rejoicing in something that actually turns out badly or doesn't, it's not that big of a deal. We often rejoice in those kind of things. You think if you won the lottery, you somehow won the lottery and you got one of the mega winners. You think, yes! But reality would actually set in. I don't know if you've ever read the statistics on major lottery winners, but they are staggering, the statistics. Almost every single person who ever won the lottery says, I wish it had never happened to me. The winning of that lottery totally destroyed my life and my family. And I think it's it's a huge percentage. Within five years, a huge percentage of them declare bankruptcy. Now, how can you declare bankruptcy? We mean, $100 million dollars. But first off, the IRS takes half of that, and then it only comes to you in installments, and people think $100 million is the end of the world, and they actually overspend 
and go bankrupt after having won $100 million. It is a, you look it up on the internet, it's a very common thing. So you're rejoicing when you see those winning numbers, but it turns out so badly that after you understood it, you wouldn't have rejoiced in it in the first place. Very often, the things that we rejoice in turn out badly or have no real effect. A man buys a new boat, and he comes home beaming with this new boat. Do you know what the old adage is about boats? The old adage of boats, there's the two best days of owning a boat. The day you buy it and the day you sell it. Now, doesn't that kind of like slap you in the face? It's like, how could that be? Because a lot of the, what we rejoice in doesn't, it's not that big of a deal and it turns out badly. The truth is, we, we know what rejoicing is, but much, much of what we rejoice in doesn't matter or doesn't turn out the way we expect it. Number three, rejoicing in the Lord is not the same as counting your blessings. Rejoicing in the Lord is not the same as counting your blessings. Now, if you know me at all, you know that I am a big proponent of expressing what the Lord has done in your life. This morning in teen Sunday school, I gave them a chance to share blessings. If I teach Sunday school, almost every time I teach Sunday school, I give an opportunity, 10 or 15 minutes, of, for people to tell what the Lord is doing in their life. On Wednesday night here, the first 10 or 15 minutes, we take time to let people say, this is what God is doing in my life, how I saw him work. I am a huge proponent of that. I am not negating any of that at this moment, but what I'm telling you is rejoicing in the Lord is not the same as counting your blessings. I think it's helpful to count your blessings. I think it's good. I think it's proper. I think we should do it. But it's not what we're talking about. It is not rejoicing in the Lord. It is rejoicing in what the Lord does. And there's a difference. And that's the difference we're after here. This morning, if you're trying to boil this all down, the difference is it's not rejoicing in what the Lord does, but rejoicing in the Lord himself. Rejoicing in the Lord is not the same as counting your blessings. Number four, we are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. We are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. We're not just to rejoice in our circumstances. We're not just to rejoice in our blessings. We're not just to rejoice in the gifts that he gives. We are to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord himself. Now, can you see the difference? It may seem like splitting hairs here, but actually the difference is monumental. The difference is a life changer. If you can split the difference between rejoicing in what God does and rejoicing in who he is, the difference is life-changing. So that's what we're trying to get to right now. I'm not telling you to quit counting your blessings. I'm asking you to sink your roots deeper than that. And it will cause your rejoicing to grow and grow and grow. Now let's try to think of terms that we can all understand here. How many of you remember as a kid, how much candy meant to you? How many can remember that? Okay. Do you remember the Jolly Ranchers? Before they were little square things you can pop in your mouth. Do you remember when they were a stick about that long? They were almost the size of a, a comb back in the day. Oh, that was such delicious. But is there ever a stickier mess than that? You peel part of that wrapper back and you get that thing, you start sucking on that, and then pretty soon the juice runs down, and the next thing you know, you are stuck to the wrapper. Remember marathon candy bars? <coughs> they last a good long time. I lost a filling with one of those. On. Do you remember lick 'em sticks? Two, a pouch, and on maybe two pouches, and then in the middle was another little pouch that had a little stick that came out. It was sugar. And the other two packets were filled with sugar, <laughs> flavored sugar. And do you remember those? How many can remember the lick 'em sticks? Okay, we're, in the, we're, we're on running here. You dip that thing in there, and the next thing you know, you are one sticky mess. Now, I could probably eat a marathon candy bar now, but 
Boy, if you, I would not be tempted. There was a lick em stick packet right there. That pure sugar just is, how many would say, I'm not about that life anymore? You know, I, some people remain with their sweet tooth, but most adults, we kind of ease out of that. We grow out of our need for all of that sugar. But as much as you like sugar and candy, do you remember what your mom used to say? Never take candy from a stranger. Never take candy from a stranger. Now, why would your mom say that? Why would she? You loved sugar. You loved candy. So why does your mom tell you, don't take candy from a stranger? Because what you would rejoice in the candy, there very possibly is an evil purpose behind it. Do you see that? So as a kid, you rejoice in candy, but if it's not the right thing, it may be something evil. Do you see that? Okay, hold that thought in your mind. Look at a different viewpoint. I assume that everyone in this room was disciplined as a child at some point. I think we can probably make that assumption. Either you got yourself a whooping, or you got grounded from the TV set, or from the telephone, or from the internet, or from any of those things, or you had to sit in the corner, or you were grounded from ever leaving the house for the rest of your life. (laughs) And then your parents figured out what a dumb idea that was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then you ground it from ever coming back. <laughs> Everybody here was disciplined at some point in your life. Now, let me ask you, do you rejoice in that? And your mind kind of does one of these, uh, 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 it kind of goes back and forth like, whoa, 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 wait. Because nobody rejoices. Hey, I get to have a spanking today. Nobody, I got grounded for the next six months. Nobody rejoices in that. But in this room today, when you think about being disciplined as a child, you have one of two reactions. Either you say, I hate that. And it's because the person doing the discipline had no care for you. A teacher who didn't care, there's sometimes even parents who didn't even care, and so they they did not discipline you correctly and for the right reason, and in your mind, you hate that at this moment. But I suppose that most people in here, although you didn't like the spanking when you got it, you sit here today thinking, I'm rejoicing. Because that discipline made me who I am today. It kept me from going off the deep end. It kept me from doing more dumb things than I was doing. It brought me and made me, rejo- made me who I am. And in my mind today, I rejoice. Now, in your mind, okay, the discipline, was it good or bad? The candy, is it good or bad? The one you say, well, candy's good, but not if it's given by a stranger. The discipline's bad, but not when it came from somebody that loved me. Now think, we don't determine events as good or bad in themselves, but based upon who gave them. Can your mind make that jump? The event itself is pleasant or unpleasant, but whether we rejoice in it or not depends on who gave it to us. Candy from a stranger is not to be rejoiced in. Discipline from someone who hates you is not to be rejoiced in. The rejoicing comes from the person who gave it. And whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, that's the determining factor, whether it's rejoiceable or not. Now, I'm hoping that your mind is making the connections here. Candy from a friend is good. Candy from a stranger is bad. Discipline from someone who cares is good. Discipline from someone who doesn't care is bad. 
whether an event is a rejoicing event or not is based upon the giver. Therefore, we don't rejoice in events, we rejoice in the giver. We recognize the event, but we rejoice in the one who gives it. We rejoice in the Lord. Now, let's see if we can take another step here. Number five, you cannot rejoice in the Lord without knowing Him. You cannot rejoice in the Lord without knowing Him. How can you know what kind of a giver He is if you don't know Him? How can you rejoice? You cannot rejoice in the Lord without knowing Him. Now let me speak carefully to two different groups in this auditorium this morning. You fit into one of two groups here. Either you know the Lord as your Savior or you do not. There's nothing to be ashamed of if you do not. Everybody sitting in this auditorium at one point did not know the Lord as their Savior. But you're sitting here today, you either know the Lord as your Savior or you do not. So let me speak to the first group first. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, there's a lot of attitudes and thoughts about God out there, are there not? Some people say, God is so loving, you try to think about what he's like. He's so loving, he could never send anybody to hell. Then other people say, God is so hard, he, he's like a baseball bat, just ready to beat me over the head. He's so hard. And everything kind of in between there, we have all of these ideas. I'll tell you today, you can rejoice in the Lord. If you could pick all the character traits of God, you had all the character traits in a box. And you could pick out, I want my God to be this, and I want him to be that. But I don't want him to be that. I need him to be this, and I need him to be that. If you could pick and choose and create a God of your own making to, the, to your specifications, I'm telling you right now, you could not do better than what you already have. For God is perfect. And you could not... Pick and choose. You say, I want him to be that, but I don't want him to be If you could pick and choose God, you would not, if you had any brains at all to see, you would not choose God any different than he actually is at this moment, who we already have. Look, you might want to choose a God who would look the other way. You know that you've sinned and you're sin, oh, you're not supposed to get into heaven, but you might choose a God who would just let you slip in behind them. I didn't see you go in, and so you just get in without... You know the sin, but he just lets you slip in. You might want a God like that. And that's the God you might choose. But let me ask you this. Do you really want to live like this for eternity? I mean, we, we can knock out a 80 or 100 years and say, man, that's all I can do. And as, this, as we get older, we think, man, this is harder than I thought. I thought when I was younger, that was the hard part. But the older I get, the harder it gets. Do you really, if God would just let you slip, do you really want to live like this the rest of your life, the rest of eternity? Could heaven, if heaven was messed up as the earth is, which would be, what would be if we let, he let sin in, one sin into the garden, look what it looked like now. Anybody call this the Garden of Eden? You say, man, this is a rough place to live. Do you really, if God would let sin into heaven, that's what we'd have. So that would not be a very good choice. You might desire that we'd have a God who would make up for your sin. You sin, and so he lets you make up for it. A lot of people are hoping for that. I'm going to, I know I've sinned, so I'm going to try to do some good. I'm going to try to make up for the bad so that God can let me into heaven. Let me ask you, do you honestly think that you could make up for all that you've done? Kind of like people with their credit cards. Next month, I'm going to cash up on my bill. I'll pay the minimum this month. Then it's so, so they swipe it, and they find out their balance next month is higher than this month. Next month, I'm going to catch up. And the next thing, in it, and pretty soon, the credit card won't swipe, swipe anymore because you've maxed out. Do you not know that this is exactly what our sin was? If you could try to pay on it and God would allow you to do that, many people are hoping that's the case, do you honestly think that you could ever get that debt paid off? And so by choosing that God, you would condemn yourself to hell without recourse. Because there's no possible way for you to pay that off.
a God who makes us work for heaven is not a good choice. But friends, you may rejoice this morning in the Lord. He does not overlook sin, nor does he put it on your account and force you to work it off. His justice will not allow that. But his love sent his only son to be born as a human baby and die on the cross in your place. Heaven is a free gift that God paid for and provides to you, to anyone who will take it. Now what could we ask for more than that? What kind of a God could you imagine in your mind that could be better than that, who would take your sin upon himself and pay all of your debt and give it to you for free? You may rejoice in the Lord. And I'm asking you this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that today you would rejoice in the Lord and take him as just that. If you do know Christ as your Savior, if you do, do you know him as any more than that? Is that as much as you know him? Have you dug into his word to learn of your God? Do you know what he likes and what he does not like? Do you know how he operates? Have you tried his promises in the crucible of life? Have you learned of him in the dark hours of trouble? Has your knowledge gone any deeper than your Sunday school facts? The facts that are in your head that never do anything other than come out your mouth. Can you actually say, I know God? You cannot rejoice in him until you know him. Number six. Knowing him causes rejoicing in every situation. Knowing him causes rejoicing in every situation. Now this is a whole focus shift and I'm hoping that you'll get this. And so let's use an illustration to see if we cannot get where we need to go here. Because knowing him, knowing God for who he actually is, will cause you to fulfill the commandment, to rejoice in him. Everybody here, or most people here, know that I like kayaking. What you may not know is the fact that I cannot swim. And what you may not know is I'm actually scared of the water. We were raised to be scared of the water, and I am actually almost terrified of the water. I cannot swim. So, say I somehow am out in the middle of the lake, bobbing up and down, going under for the last time, and some guy on the shore sees me. And he dives in the water and he swims out to me and he drags me back to shore and saves my life. Okay? He's just rescued me. What do you think that man's response will be when he gets me to the shore and I say, thank you for rescuing me. You know, I'm hungry. Can I borrow 20 bucks off you? Let me ask you this. What if I run back into the water? and start drowning again. Will that same man swim out and get me? It's a good question, isn't it? For what he did once, he might not do again. He might say, pal, if <laughs> I'm not, I already risked my life once, I'm not going to do it a second time. If I said, hey, uh, give me the 20 bucks, would he or would he not? He may have some sympathy for me. Say the guy's just drowning, he's hungry, he might give me 20 bucks. But if I say after that, hey, you know the transmission in my car is going out. Think you could help me out here. Now, somewhere along the line, your mind says, if I was the guy who rescued you, I'd say, look, I did that for you. Isn't that enough? Right? And to expect any more of that than, than the first time gift of my life, to expect any more than that is a stretch. Everybody understands that. And you can't expect to go back to that same source again. But do you know this is exactly why we should rejoice in the Lord? Do you know that when the Lord rescued you, He intended to keep supplying every single thing that you needed? Who else could you ask to do that? 
Who else could you expect to do that? The guy that saved my life at the beach, <laughs> that's all he's going to do for me. He may even want something in return for that. But he's not going to expect me to ask for him for 20 bucks. But God, when he decided to save me, had already expected to provide every single thing I would need. Because that is who he is. And that, my friend, is a rejoicable situation. Is this not what it means when it says, Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? It was in God's nature, it is in God's nature to give. And when we know him, we realize that giving us salvation was not just a one-time event. He planned on continually giving. By knowing him, that we know that we have freely all things that we need for this life. And we rejoice in him. If we know God, we know that He is a good God and does good things. And there is no evil or selfishness lurking in His heart. You've got to get this. We have to understand, when you really actually know God, you know that there is no evil at all lurking in His heart. You find evil in the weirdest places. Yesterday I was coming back from down southeastern Iowa, southwestern Iowa, and I stopped at a garage sale. And they had some vintage toys there that I really thought I could use. <laughs> and so, there was an older lady that had them. She was selling her husband's stuff. And she, I'm a kind of a wheeler dealer, because, you know, I, I sell this stuff, and you've got to have the right price. It's good stuff, but you've got to get it at the right price in order to make any money on it. So I'm trying to wheel and deal here a little bit, and this is her wheeling and dealing. She says... I said, how much do you want? For? Nothing was marked. I hate garage sales where nothing is marked. I hate that. Because when you have them, because you, you're like, how much is that? How much is that? How much is that? How much? And it, it gets really old. Because I'm willing to buy anything that I can make money on. So anyway, she says, this is her wheeling and dealing. She goes, that's $5, and that's $5, and that's $5. But if you buy all three together, I'll sell them to you for $15. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a long one here. <laughs> so anyway, she had a bunch of stuff that I wanted. Meanwhile, customers were coming, and a customer from previous who bought something before came, and there was this big dresser-looking thing. And I was looking at these toys, and this, these two, the, one, the lady who owned the garage sale stuff was a fairly old lady, and there was a medium-aged lady there, and they were trying to carry this thing out. And I was so engrossed in what I was doing that I wasn't paying any attention. When I pulled myself out, I realized that they were struggling with this thing. So I went over and I grabbed hold and I said, here, let me carry that out to your car for you. And I carried it out. Now, this wasn't my first thought. But a side thought. I wonder if I help here, <laughs> if this will help in my negotiations. Now, do you see that? That is ulterior motives. That is not pure goodness. Do you understand that? You, it's easy to see it in my heart, okay? We often think about God in this way. There are no ulterior motives. There's not any on the side, I think I can get this out of him if I do that. God is a good God. There's no ulterior motives. And when he gives, he intended to continually give without anything that's coming back to him. He freely gives us all things. My friend, this is a rejoicable God. We do not look at the events that come into our lives and say, that's good and that's bad and that's medium and that's bad and that's real bad. God brings them into our lives and he has full control and has no ulterior motives. The events may be pleasant or unpleasant. They may be understandable or not understandable. But because of the nature of God, they're all good. 
and we rejoice in the Lord. Because we know His nature. His nature is to do us good and to provide for us. And therefore, we rejoice not in the events. We rejoice in Him. Is this not the meaning of Psalm 118, 24? This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Is this not the meaning of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Is this not the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5, 18? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We do not have to keep score with the circumstances. This is good and this is bad. Because God is a good God. It is his nature to be good. And we recognize that God is working in our lives. And we are thankful for the blessings. But we know that pleasant or unpleasant, it is all for our good. We look beyond our circumstances to the cause, and we rejoice in Him. We rejoice in the Lord. Let's pray.